Welcome to my channel. Let's look at the anatomy of the sacrum. The sacrum is the first and the widest region of the large intestine. This is the large intestine highlighted in red, and the first or the initial region of the large intestine is the cecum. It is the widest region of the large intestine, and this is the cecum, harrowed in black. The cecum is a blind pouch that is located in the right iliac fossa. This is the configuration of the pelvic bone. This is the right side, and this is the left side. This is the iliac fossa highlighted here, which is a fossa that is created on the anterior part of the ilium. The ilium is one of the subdivisions of the pelvic bone, and this is the iliac fossa on the left. On the right side is where we have the location of the cecum because of the position of the cecum. This is where it begins from, and it is placed in the right iliac fossa. It is seen to be located below the opening of the ilium, we know that the ilium is the terminal region of the small intestine. This is the small intestine highlighted in blue, and the terminal part of the small intestine is the ilium. And this is the region that terminates into the cecum, and it terminates at this level. So from this level is where we have the beginning of the cecum. So the cecum begins at this region, and it descends down to be located within the right iliac fossa. It is about 6.5 centimeter in length, and 7.5 centimeter in diameter. You can see that it is the widest region of the large intestine, considering the dimension that it presents. Let's go to the functions of the cecum. The cecum is responsible for the absorption of fluid and also electrolyte. We know that absorption occur at a minimal rate in the large intestine when compared with the small intestine. We've tried to highlight this in our lecture on the differences between the small intestine and the large intestine. If you've not checked that lecture, or oh, please kindly go and do so, so as to keep yourself updated. In the large intestine, we have minimal rates of absorption, and what it absorbs is liquid and also electrolyte. If you look at the interior of the cecum, you see that it appears to be thick, and this thickness is to enhance the absorption of fluid and also electrolytes. It is also the first region of the large intestine, so it is the first space that receives undigested food that is coming from the small intestine. We know that digestion occurs in the small intestine, but there are still some particles that are left undigested and this is directed into the large intestine. The first region of the large intestine that receives this undigested food substances is the cecum and this is the structure highlighted in black. So it receives this undigested food and it also helps to create space for this undigested food to mix with the bacteria that are present within the wall of the large intestine. We already established this also in a lecture on the large intestine that within the large intestine, what we have are bacteria, we do not have digestive enzymes. So the bacteria tends to, to take the place of these digestive enzymes as they are not seen within the wall of the large intestine. So they help to break down the undigested food substances. So the cecum creates space for the mixing of the bacteria and also these undigested food substances. And these are the bacteria seen to digest or break down the food substances or particles that have been released into the cecum. So looking at the configuration of the cecum on the outside, there are some distinct features that are also seen to be presented within the wall of the cecum. Looking at it from the outside, we already know the general configuration of the large intestine. There are three distinct features that will be seen, and this include the tinea coli. We already described also the tinea coli in our previous lecture on the large intestine. We say there are three bands of fibers that are seen to run through the entire length of the large intestine. They are also seen within the cecum. Because of this, we also have the formation of ostration or circulation, which are baggy or segmental appearance that is created by the tinea coli. And this is established as a result of the tinea coli, which is shorter in length than the length of the large intestine itself. And of course, it needs to run through the entire length of the large intestine. And that is why we have the creation of this appearance. And this is the tinea coli highlighted here in yellow. And you see it's running through the entire length of the large intestine. This is also seen in the wall of the cecum. And they are seen to converge at the base of the appendix. This is the appendix here highlighted in black. The appendix is a finger-like out pouch that is seen at the posterior medial part of the cecum. As the tinea coli 
are seen to run through the entire length of the ligature. You see them converging at the base of the appendix. And this is what is presented here in this image. And of course, they run through the cecum also. And that is why you see that oscillation created in the external feature of the cecum. And this is the baggy or segmental appearance that is seen at the external configuration of the cecum due to the, the clinia coli that is seen to run through the entire length of the cecum because the length of the clinia coli is shorter than the length of the cecum. And that is why the creation of this folding at the, the external part of the cecum. Then the last structure is the epiplec appendages. Epiplec appendages are fatty tags, and these are the epiplec appendages. They are seen to be located on both sides of the tinea coli. We already established that the tinea coli will run through the entire length of the cecum. And on both sides of the tinea coli, we have fat deposits that are called epiploid appendages. This epiploid appendages is not just limited to the cecum. It is also seen along the other regions of the large intestine. This does not present any function, but are just seen as fat deposits on both sides of the tinea coli. And if you look at this image down here, this is like a T-section of the cecum. So this highlighted in red down here is the wall of the cecum. And you see the tinea coli running through like that, the entire length of the cecum. And on both sides of the tinea coli, you have fat deposits that are called epiploic appendages. And these are highlighted in blue. So we should also know that the tinea coli, the formation of ostration and also epiploic appendages are also seen in the external feature of the cecum. So let's look at the internal configuration. If you take a look at the internal configuration of the cecum, we see two openings. The first opening is at the medial side, and you see another opening at the medial side, but more posteriorly. Let's look at these openings. Let's look at what opens into them and also what they do. The first one that is seen on the medial side is the leucica orifice, and this is the leucica orifice. The leucica orifice may break in that the name. You know what it means. It means the orifice that is bounded between the ileum and also the cecum. So it is this orifice here. This is the opening that is seen within the interior of the cecum. And this is the opening here created. And this is guided by the leucical valve. And this is the leucical valve highlighted in yellow. So this valve is seen to help control the passage of food from the ileum into the cecum. And it is opened at this level. And this level where it opens into the cecum is called the transtubacular plane. This is the transtubacular plane highlighted in green. From this plane here downward is where we have the cecum. And this means that the cecum begins from the transtubacular plane here downward. If you try to extract this leucical valve, this is the kind of configuration that is seen. It is made up of two flap or leaf. So you have a superior leaf and an inferior leaf. So this is the superior leaf, this is the inferior leaf. And the leaves at both sides, they make you to become the frenula. And this is one frenulum. And on the other side, we have another frenulum. This kind of configuration helps to prevent the backflow or the reflux of food particles goes into the small intestine. At the posterior medial side, we have the appendicular orifice. And this is the appendicular orifice here. This appendicular orifice is guided by the valve of gelage. This is not a true kind of valve. It is seen about two centimeters from the opening of the ileum. So we have the leucical valve up here. So the distance between the leucical valve and also the valve of gelage that opens into the appendix is about two centimeters. Both orifices are seen at the medial side of the cecum. One is seen more anteriorly and one is seen more posteriorly. But the distance between the two openings is about two centimeters from each other. So let's look at peritoneal relation. We already established in our previous lecture on intra and retroperitoneal organs that the cecum is an intraperitoneal organ. And this means that the cecum is almost completely covered by peritoneum, although it does not present a distinct formation of mesentery. Look at the posterior part of the cecum. There is a space or a recess that is created, and this space is called the retrocecal recess. So it is seen behind the cecum. And this tends to create accommodation sites for a retrocecal appendix. We know that the appendix can take different kinds of position. So when we have the appendix taking a retrocecal position, the appendix will be located within the retrocecal recess. So it tends to create like an accommodation site for the appendix that is of retrocecal position. 
So talking about the relations, what are the structures that are related to the cecum? Posteriorly, the structures that are related to it include the right psoas muscle. This is the pelvic bone, and this is the right side, this is the left side. So we have the psoas muscle. The psoas muscle extends from the lumbar region, and it descends to be inserted at the upper part of the femur. And during this course, it is seen to be located in the anterior part of the iliac fossa. And if it is located in the anterior part of the iliac fossa, remember in our previous slide, we established that the cecum is located within the right iliac fossa. It means that the swast muscle will be seen as a posterior relation of the cecum. This is the left side. So if this also is taken to this side, it's going to present the same kind of configuration. So it's going to be related posteriorly to the right swast muscle. This is the left psoas muscle. So the right one is what is related posteriorly to the cecum. Also, we have the iliacus muscle. This is the iliacus muscle that is highlighted in yellow. The iliacus muscle is seen to pad up or fill up the iliac fossa. And this is what it does here. Also, in the right iliac fossa, we are going to be seeing the iliacus muscle also filling up the right iliac fossa. And if it is filling up this fossa, it is going to be posteriorly related to the cecum because we have also established established that the cecum is located in the right iliac fossa. Then other structures will include the testicular or the ovarian artery. This is the abdominal aorta in the abdominal region. And we know that we have the emergence of the testicular or the ovarian artery from the abdominal aorta. So as they emerge, they also pass through the right iliac fossa. And it is from this cause that they are able to be related to the posterior part of the cecum. And this kind of configuration will also be presented on the right side. So we also see the testicular and the ovarian artery also as a posterior relation of the cecum on the right side. Then we also have some nerves that emerge from the lumbar plexus. We have the right genitofemoral nerve. We also have the right femoral nerve. Then we have the right lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh. So these three nerves are also related to the posterior surface or region of the cecum. So we try to use this space to to illustrate the structures that are related to the posterior region of the cecum. So if you try to take these structures to this right part, you see that on the right side, these structures also will be related posteriorly to the cecum. The anteriorly, what we have is the loop of the small intestine. The small intestine we know is located at the central part and the loop also extends to be an anterior relation of the cecum. So we have the loop of the small intestine, then we have the anterior abdominal wall. So let's look at the blood supply. The blood supply of the cecum is from the superior mesenteric artery. This is the abdominal aorta. From the abdominal aorta, we have the emergence of the superior mesenteric artery, and this is superior mesenteric artery. From the superior mesenteric artery, we have the iliocolic artery. This is the iliocolic artery. From mere breaking down the name, iliocolic artery will supply the ileum, which is the terminal part of the small intestine, and also the cecum. So the leucolic artery then gives off anterior and posterior cecal arteries. This anterior and posterior cecal arteries is what branches from the leucolic artery to supply the cecum. Then the venous drainage is through the corresponding named vein, which then drains into the superior mesenteric vein and finally into the portal vein. Lymphatic drainage. The lymphatic drainage of the cecum is the leucolic lymph nodes, which then drain into the superior mesenteric lymph nodes. Innervation, we have the sympathetic innervation and the parasympathetic innervation. For the sympathetic innervation, we have the superior mesenteric plexus, and that ranges from T11 to L1 spinal segment. Then for the parasympathetic innervation, we have the vagus nerve. Let's check our understanding of this lecture through the following question. And the first one will be to describe the external features of the cecum. The second question will be to explain the structural outline of the orifices in the cecum. The third question is what is retrocecal recess? And the last question will be to describe the blood supply of the cecum. So thanks for watching. Let's meet again.